I'm going to start by outlining uh, some of the key literatures uh, of both incidents and outcomes of intraoperative uh, hypotension. And then we're going to go on to discuss how we can actually fix it. Um, and before we start, we really need to define intraoperative hypotension because I think everyone's aware that, that there are, have been different actual uh, definitions according to different studies. And I think everyone's really uh, got a map of less than 65 millimeters for greater than one minute really as a, as a sort of good baseline definition now, but less than 60 had been originally used. And the other thing that we also talk about is a relative reduction in mean arterial pressure greater than 20% from baseline. But I think the key message in all the studies, it's the duration and depth of hypotension, which are the key factors that consistently cause harm. And there's too much literature to present on this really, uh, but the, the overall goals is we've got two key issues. We know that interoperative hypotension has an effect on mortality, all cause morbidity, and also longer hospitalization, and therefore not just patient outcomes, but it has a big impact on hospital and healthcare financial uh, cost. So it's bad news for everyone. With the organ specific problems, I think there's been a lot of focus recently on AKI because we can map that more recently myocardial injury because of the sensitive troponins that we can now do. But there's also a link between intraoperative hypotension and postoperative congestive heart failure, stroke, delirium, cognitive decline, and when you're looking at general surgical patients, we know there's a relationship between an astomotic leak, particularly an esophagectomy, and mean arterial pressure drop. So I'm just going to select a few papers out because there's too many to present exactly. I think this is a good starting point, Louis Sun's study in, in anesthesiology 2015. And I think what that was very good at is they investigated the uh, association between different levels of blood pressure, amino mean arterial pressure less than 55, 60 and 65. The primary outcome was AKI defined by a 50% drop or a 0.3 milligram per deciliter increase in creatinine during the first two post-optive days. And they showed that AKI occurred in 6.3% of patients and that again there was a signal that the lower the blood pressure, particularly less than 55, there was odds ratio of 2.3, and the longer the duration and the lower, the higher the odds ratio of AKI was. I do like this paper, which is in the BJA, and it's by the Dutch group led by Wesselink uh, and Van Klei. And they did a systematic review of looking at hypotension, and this is non-cardiac surgery, 42 articles, and looking at the association between absolute and relative intraoperative hypotension definitions and their association with the different postoperative adverse outcomes. And they really looked at uh, duration and different targets. And what I like about this study is I think it, it gives us a, a good sort of a heat zone map of where the dangers are. Uh, I hope this is projecting well, but sometimes on Zoom, the definition isn't always that good. So I'm, I'm sorry, that's... Um... Sorry about that, the technical controls weren't working so good there. Um, so this graph basically shows mortality, acute kidney injury, myocardial injury, and overall organ injury across the top there. And then the boxes on the left you've got different mean arterial pressure starting 80 at the top, going down to 40 at the bottom. And then the other four numbers in that box is the duration. So greater than one, greater than five, greater than 10, greater than 20 minutes. So you can immediately see here, the, the red is dangerous where you've got uh, odds ratio greater than two of harm. So you can immediately see that uh, a absolute blood pressure of less than 50 even just greater than one minute, your odds ratios are increased. So we know that 50 is, is a no-no. We know that 55, uh, which is the fourth box up, you've got uh, the longer and lower you go, more dangerous. And the same signal at 65 and 60. Um, so, I, so that's why I've presented this one. So it's very good because this is a, a combination of all the papers put together. 
Then we've got what really is now the landmark paper from anesthesia on, anesthesiology in 2017. This is the Cleveland Clinic group, um, uh, Sam Azzi's paper, and obviously Dan Sessler and Andrea Kurtz involved with this whole group. And what they were looking at is um, the lowest map below various absolute and, very, and relative thresholds for cumulative time under that graph of one, three, and five, and 10 minutes. So it's time-weighted averages for these map thresholds. And again, it showed the, the, the lower your blood pressure was and the longer you went there, the more harm there was. And I think these graphs are, 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 are nice. So on the left, we've got um, the uh, kidney injury, AKI, and then we've got uh, MINS, which is um, myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery. The top graphs basically show the relationship between mean arterial pressure and the inflection point at which the risk goes up. And the y-axis here is estimated probability of AKI. So you can see there's this inflection um, around about 65 millimeters of mercury. It goes up pretty fast after that. And then the bottom graphs show that the lowest percent decrease from baseline map uh, with the same sort of inflection. So you might say, well, we know that a lot of patients have multi-organ problems and can, oh, we do we need to be bothered with just looking at uh, this in young people? Well, I, in this literature research, I actually pulled this paper, which I, was new to me really the last few weeks, by Tang in the kidney blood pressure research. And this is another big cohort retrospective series of almost 5,000 patients. And they showed that even in patients under 60 with an EGFR of less than 60 in major surgery, there was still an instance of AKI. And again, the, the graphs are very similar. The, the lower you go, the longer you go, the increased signal there is of injury. So what, what I'd like to sort of talk about is, is, so we've got this whole picture of that hypotension is bad. It's not just kidneys and hearts. Those are the ones that are easy to map, but it's all cause morbidity and mortality in hospital length of stay. And there's often an analogy, isn't there, between anesthesia and the aircraft industry. And when we get in a plane, we expect to arrive at a dis destination safe. And yet we wouldn't expect our pilot to fly the plane across the tree line. We'd expect to have a bit of bit of height above the trees and uh, so you've got a buffer zone and also you've got your forward looking radar which tells you to tip the plane up if, if a mountain's coming. Um, and so why do we not in anesthesia just try to fly the plane a little bit higher than the maps that we traditionally do to try and avoid this zone of risk? So I, I like this paper in hypertension that's just come out this year um, by Li Zong Meng and Gelb's group. And I think what they're saying is we need to really start individualizing blood pressure targets. And we need to think carefully about, you know, what are the risk factors with the patient? What are the risk factors of the surgery? Uh, how low can we go for how long? Obviously, if there's bleeding, the risk benefit might be to, to, to drop the pressure slightly at that point. But it's just to get us thinking a little bit more. And then wouldn't it be wonderful if we had some sort of machine that could help guide us to uh, like an, an, a front looking radar in a plane that we know we're gonna get a problem. So have we got any studies which show that we have fixed this problem? Well, yes, we have. Um, because this uh, study in JAMA, which is called the IMPRESS study by Emmanuel Futier and his, his group in France, they tried to individualize uh, the blood pressure goals for patients according to their starting blood pressure. And they did it in high risk surgery for patients having more than two hours long surgery. And they first of all corrected flow and then they used low dose norepinephrine con to control the map. So they had a good uh, cohort of patients um, and I'm going to show you how they manage the blood pressure. Um, but first of all, the, interestingly, they didn't actually show any difference between severe adverse events or 30-day mortality. But what the study did show was a very strong signal of harm uh, in those patients.
patients that didn't have their, their MAP restored with low dose norepinephrine. And they all had an increased risk of post-operative organ dysfunction. So to give you an idea of the differences in the blood pressures, you can see from this graph where orange is the standard treatment and blue is the individualized treatment. We're only nudging the MAP up to five to 10 millimeters of mercury, but back to where uh, within 10% of their starting point. So it's not a big difference. And remember they fixed fill, uh, you know, the intravascular volume first. And that's what I always sort of tell my residents, fill flow pressure. So you fix fill, uh, fi fix the preload, make sure there's enough flow, and then you fix the afterload. Um, and interestingly, the signal was here that if you maintain perfusion and flow, your heart, your kidneys um, and brain do better. And also your gut does better. So you get less downstream sepsis. But also because you're not throwing lots of fluid at a hypotensive patient, there's also a signal of reduced pulmonary injury of hypoxemia and, and, and pneumonia. And this graph shows the probability of post-operative organ dysfunction. Uh, the low, and obviously the, the higher, the worse. So the standard treatment is really the control group. And you can see the indiv individualized treatment the probability of post-operative organ dysfunction was much reduced. So is it still relevant? Well, I think it is because this paper alone from the MPOG group for Nirar Shah and Sachin Kirtapal, they showed in 22,000 patients, ASA three and four, undergoing major surgery within three hours, that 88% of cases still had at least one hypotensive event defined as a mean arterial pressure less than 65 millimeters of mercury for a minute. But the mean duration of hypotension was around about 28 minutes. Uh, but interestingly, there's, there's, there was variability across the different institutions. That, uh, and so I've always looked with quality improvement that where there's variability, it means you can affect change and therefore affect outcome. So that's good to have that because it means we can, uh, we can actually affect a change. And then there's this one last very big study um, by Andy Shaw's group. It's IMPRESS with anesthesia and analgesia. Uh, and Andy has used uh, basically big data uh, from the premier data set looking at multiple centers across 368,000 non-cardiac surgeries. And what they really showed looking at different, they used different ways to analyze this. Uh, and they showed this constant signal of harm with hypotension just as we're going on so i think you know we've got two really big papers here even in 2020 which are still showing harm so this is still a relevant problem that we've got here uh, and you can see it on here the estimated odds of a major adverse cardiac or cerebrovascular event in 30 days post-surgery was increased um, between 12 and 26 percent depending on what your hypotension is and interestingly, uh, Andy's group has detected a signal even with a map less than 75 uh, millimeters of mercury, which really I think is the first uh, big cohort study to identify that. But it's not all bad news because um, we're talking about Acumen HPI software today and how to use it. And these two studies show that if you have used it in the OR, you can affect change. And so the, the first paper is Winchberg's study in JAMA surgery and they used the HPI software and saw a 75% reduction in intraoperative hypotension compared to their control group. And it's significant because it was uh, reduced from 32 minutes down to eight minutes. And I think you saw from the large data that I presented that less than 10 minutes is, is obviously advantageous. And secondly, there's Emmanuel Smith's group and they then showed that you could reduce uh, HPI uh, using HPI in hypotension. I'm now going to hand over to Brad to give you an overview of HPI, how it works in the interface, and then we're going to show you some clinical uh, scenarios and talk through those and how we use this software in practice. Hand over to you, Brad. Perfect. Thank you, Mike. All right, so let's take a clinical look at the Acumen Hypertension Predictive Index. So Acumen HPI software is a new technology that predicts the likelihood of a patient trending towards a hypotensive event. And now we can use that additional insight as well and the additional parameters that we'll dive into 
to find the root cause of the hypotension and proactively treat it or proactively prevent it prior to becoming hypotensive. So it consists of an Acumen IQ sensor or a transducer and then an advanced hemodynamic monitor. If we can go to the next slide, yeah, thank you. Uh, with secondary parameters such as cardiac output, cardiac index, EA dyne, DPDT or measure of contractility, stroke volume variation, pulse pressure variation, and that HPI number that we're going to dive into. So from the arterial waveform, there can be a lot of features extracted from just a single waveform. And these waveform features, if we can go to the next slide, these go back one. The, these features um, such as aortic compliance, stroke volume, vascular tone, afterload, contractility, and more are extracted. Along with these features, additional features can be computed based on their variability, complexity, and dynamic associations. So if we total all these diff different features together and in combinations, we come up with about 2.6 million different combinations. And here are six examples of, of the 2.6 million features derived from an arterial blood pressure waveform. So not all these features are important and they don't all predict uh, or predict the likelihood of hypotension. And that's where machine learning comes in. So from the 2.6 million features, if we can go to the next slide, from the 2.6 million features, two machine learning techniques were applied to identify the 23 most predictive features. These features are not just single characteristics, but rather combinatorial factors, which incorporate how the different characters or characteristics interact with each other. So the higher the HPI value, the more likely the patient is trending towards a hypotensive event. I like to think of this as a measure of instability. HPI will increase when it detects more instability from monitoring those specific 23 arterial waveform characteristics. And it does this rapidly by updating every 20 seconds. So if we look at this graph here on the right, we see that when the HPI alarm reaches 85, there's about a 93% event rate that'll happen within four minutes. So it gives us that time to proactively prevent a hypotensive event. So clinically, how does this appear in the OR? The HPI number, as you can see around 1122, crosses the threshold of 85, while the patient's MAP is still 73. So Acumen HPI software is gonna predict the hypotension or the likelihood of hypotension occurring. And it did this by predicting it 10 minutes prior to when the patient became hypotensive at 1132. As you can see, the HPI continued to climb and remain elevated, indicating that ongoing instability. Now with this technology and that warning of hypertension, we can prevent this prior to occurring, which is Dr. Scott showed us in those large population data will help improve patient outcomes. So what is HPI? HPI is a number that relates to the likelihood of trending towards a hypotensive event as defined as a MAP less than 65 for greater than one minute. The higher the number, the more likely the hypotensive event will occur. And the higher the number, the shorter that time period until that hypotensive event. And the opposite is true. The lower the number, the less likely a hypotensive event will occur or the longer the time period until a hypotensive event may occur. So Acumen HPI software has three key elements. The HPI number, which is a value from one to 100. The HPI pop-up alert, which appears after two consecutive readings of a higher than 85 on the HPI. And then the secondary screen provides further details about the potential causes and treatments of the hypotensive event. And so we can get at the root cause rather than just temporizing it with a, a typical vasopressor or more fluid when it's not necessary. So this is a picture of what the secondary screen looks like. We see parameters such as stroke volume variation, which, with the percentage, which is a percentage difference between the minimum and maximum stroke volume during a respiratory cycle. Now when SVV can't be used, which is, occurs in some of our patient population in the OR, we can still test to see if the patient is preload dependent by using delta stroke volume. We do this by providing a fluid bolus of at least 250 mLs over three minutes. And if they increase their stroke volume by greater than 10%, we consider that patient preload dependent, which means that they will increase their stroke volume and subsequently their cardiac output with the fluid bolus. We also have a measure of contractility. So by monitoring and trending the arterial DPDT, which is the maximum upslope of their arterial waveform from a peripheral artery. And we have EA dying, which is a measure of afterload to the left ventricle. Now don't think of this as an afterload component that you would chase with vasopressors like SVR or systemic vascular resistance. 
This is a measure to tell us if the patient's going to increase their blood pressure to a fluid bolus, as known as a pressure responder. And we'll dive into this component later in the presentation.